So this week, what will happen is you're going to learn a lot more about computer vision, specifically for robots. It's, you know, it's kind of interesting um, how powerful cameras have become. They are not a very recent invention. You would trace it back 100 years. Um, but in the last 20 years, we managed to make them digital. And the last five or 10 years, we managed to make them very, very small. Many of you, I'm sure, have a smartphone. I have an iPhone myself. If you flip it, you're going to see a very little camera that actually can run at 240 hertz. It's several megapixels that it includes. In this very room, we may have more than 100 cameras. In this building, there may be 1,000 cameras. In the city, probably there's a billion. Cameras are that many, and we use them very widely. It used to be the case that working with cameras for robotics was very, very hard for a reason that you would get a lot of data, and it was just very hard to process that data. Just in the last five or 10 years, we're realizing that you know, we finally have the computers that can crank through that data. That kind of computer, the kind of computer that you need to work through computer vision, the like camera data, is actually, um, I mean, you can, you can work with it with fast computers, but many people utilize these GPUs that I know by now you should know that you have one in your car. Um, that NVIDIA computer comes with a GPU that has 256 cores on it that can parallel process, for example, camera images. You can do some interesting things with it. So, um, so we're just gonna kick off this week, uh, today, and I'm going to present to you, you know, a few things in camera-based perception or, or, or using cameras for robotics. Um, what I have for you is a, a quick, you know, like a brief historical overview um, of how we ended up with cameras, uh, as opposed to other sensors, right? And, and we're going to talk a little bit about sort of very low level robot vision, like what you can use cameras for in a very set of easy tasks. And, and you're going to be doing, it says next week, but it's this week, you know, you're going to be doing like a visual servoing lab uh, with this one. Okay, so this is going to be a, a quick kickoff of the week and then you can kind of keep going for it. So these slides are actually very similar. So this morning I was, you know, looking through my slides that I had prepared a couple weeks ago and, um, and I inter incorporated a few slides from actually the lecture that I teach to MIT students in the robotics class. So this is one of the lectures that very similar to one of the lectures that we teach for the robotics class, okay? So let me start with um, like a discussion on cameras such as eyes. So we all have eyes, we look at the world, that's how we perceive the world. Interestingly, we have two eyes. Um, there are various reasons, one of them is robustness. You know, if something happens to one of your eyes, even if you aren't seeing very well with one eye, you can see with the other eye. There's that. And we have two eyes also because, you know, with two eyes you can see some depth. Because you have, if you have one eye here that's kind of seeing the scene from one viewpoint, the other eye is seeing it from another viewpoint. And this difference in the two viewpoints tells you about how far certain objects are. That is not how we perceive 3D in general. Like when I look at this world, if I close one of my eyes, I can still kind of understand 3D. The way we see it is, you know, we understand where the chairs are, where people are, the distances, scale, and so on, and we reconstruct it in our brain. You will do a lot of that with robots. But also, at near distances, like if one of you were to throw me a tennis ball and it's coming, I don't even see it, um, my stereo eyes, when it gets closer, understands that something is approaching very fast. Before it even goes to my brain, my spine will pull my head back. That's how we use your st our stereo eyes. And you'll see in a second that you, know, you can use your stereo camera on your car, you have one, to perceive depth in that manner as well. Let's start with the eye. If you, you, know, if you look through the nature, you will see a lot of different types of eyes. It seems like you know, how eye has evolved is that first, you, know, you could find animals that just have some photoreceptors and nerve cells that would be connected to their neural structures. A photoreceptor is, is good because you, know, you usually want to, like if you're, I don't know, swimming in the sea, you often want to be where the sun is because that's where the plants are. So you can you know, feed on plants that way. Interestingly, you can have like a little cavity, right? If you have a little cavity 
and the, and the eye inside a cavity, then you can turn around and see from which direction you're getting the best amount of light. And you can go that direction. Now, that you could develop into a retina and a cornea, the, the thing that we have, so that you can turn the eye around pretty easily. And at the same time, you can focus on things. It seems like the eye that we have has developed that way. And we can, we can look at nature and find you know, kind of less and less developed versions of our eye. If you look through the nature, you will see a lot of different eyes as well. For example, there are compound eyes. Instead of having a lens, right, there's just kind of several different eyes kind of packed up in a, in a single compound. Or you know, there are animals that just have, you know, like these little primitive eyes in, 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 in surrounding the animal. Like you can have those kind of things as well. So this is something we had in nature for a long time. And back 100 years ago, people would look at this design and would, would, would say, well, you know, could we build similar things? They would actually know this thing. So first set of experiments like that have actually started, you know, in the time of you know, ancient China or, or the, the things that are recorded that we know are from Leonardo da Vinci's experiments. Interestingly, Leonardo used the Latin term camera obscura. Camera means room. Obscura means dark. So literally, it means dark room. So the experiment was to set up a dark room with a little pinhole on one side. If you stand inside the room, the light coming from outside will be projected on the other side of the room. I don't know if you've ever done this kind of an experiment before, but it works pretty well. You just need a pretty dark room and a little pinhole. And you can see whatever is on the other side upside down on the screen. So Leonardo would do these kinds of experiments and get people into the camera obscura, dark room and would impress them inside the dark room. And um, so you would see, for example, something like this inside the room. So this is, again, you know, flipped upside down, but you would see this upside down. Whatever is outside, you would see it inside. You just need good lighting conditions. Um, clearly, people wanted to exploit this for photography. So people wanted to, they were imagining things where you would, what if you could put something there that whatever is coming into the camera obscura, you can etch it, for example into some form of structure. So back in the day, you know, this is, we're talking about, you know, 1800s, right? Nowadays, we're so excited about computers and autonomy and robots. People used to be very excited about chemistry. I mean, you could take a substance and add it to another substance and get a different one. Things would flame or things would, you know, boil and so on. So people were extremely interested. It was the invention of the day, chemistry. So they would try to use, for example, maybe take a little something and put it there and, and be able to etch it. Interestingly, this was done by, by um, Joseph Neves. Um, so who, what he did is that he took a little kind of like an aluminum plate that was coated with some sort of a material, some chemical that was very light sensitive. So if you put it under light, it would change color, right? So he took that material and he put it into a camera obscura upside down so that the camera obscura would, would etch the image from outside into that, into that aluminum. So now that first picture is kept at Henry Ransom Center, and you can see it on one side. It's, of course, it's a little bit, you know, it's not in the best form that, that was obtained back in the day in, in 1800s. Kodak has a reproduction of the image. What it, had looked like the first day it was taken, and it looks like this. One thing you can see is, I mean, you're kind of seeing some buildings, you know, it looks like a pretty nice place in France, and um, looks like a great view. But one thing you can notice is that, can you guys see that there's sun reflection on both sides? Like the sun reflects on this side of the building and this other side of the building. You can see there's a little roof going out, and there's like sort of, it's in between two buildings, but. You can see sun is reflected on one building and the other building as well. Can everyone see that? You, you want to guess why that may be? Yep. Because it took, the process took like an entire day so the sun moved. Oh. Yes, that's correct. So this was a long process. Okay, the process took an entire day. So the sun started from one side, they put the aluminum plate, the sun moved all the way to the other side, and it took that much time to etch this photo. And so when you look at it, sun shines on both sides of the walls. 
so um, this was, I believe, in 1880s, and, and, and we came a long way uh, since then. Um, okay, and we came a long way since then. Nowadays, the kind of technology that we use is digital, and it's actually based on this thing called photoelectric effect. Everyone knows Einstein, right? Uh, Einstein got a Nobel Prize. Everyone knows that. You would think that that Nobel Prize was in relativity theory or, or something like that. It's not. The Nobel Prize that Einstein got is in photoelectric effect. So what Einstein discovered, you know, back sort of 1905, along with, so Einstein apparently wrote a lot of papers in 1905, three good papers in 1905. Two of them are related to relativity and one of them is related to this. It's the photoelectric effect. So it turns out that you can arrange silica, silicon oxygen two, into a form so that right when the light shines, the photons hit that silica, you can generate a little bit of electricity. And you could, so Einstein was thinking back in the day that you could harvest that electricity so that you could record images digitally back in 1905 which we achieved about 70 years later. So in 1975, the first electronic CCD camera that's based on this technology came on the market made by Kodak. By the way, Kodak is, you know, it just, I don't know if you know, but it just closed as a company. A hundred years ago, Kodak was like a Google. You know, it was like the biggest company on earth type of thing. And, and it was bringing this photographic technology and people would take cameras from Kodak. It was a huge deal, okay? It was like your iPhone, that you would take a camera and you could, you could picture, take pictures of things. Um, but in 1975, it was still a big company and they built the first CCD digital camera based on this technology. And this camera had a resolution of 100 by 100 and it had one bit for every pixel. It could either tell you whether that pixel is white or black, all right? So that would give you a huge 0.01 megapixels. Um, and the image capture time was 23 seconds. So you had to wait for 23 seconds for it to capture the image. Now the biggest bottleneck wasn't the sensor, but was more like taking the data and writing it into a disk. This is still the biggest bottleneck, by the way. We can still take pictures in parallel. The problem is that if you have you know, millions of pixels, it would be a megabyte if you had one byte for every one of your pixels. You have a lot more than one byte and you have a lot more than a megapixel. So at every capture, you'd be taking several megabytes. At every second, you'd be doing 30 to 50, maybe 100 captures. So there would be gigabytes of data every single second, one gigabyte. One gigabyte of data, if you wanted to push it through a copper wire every second, that's at as much as you can get out of copper wires. If you want to do more, you have to use fiber optic or something like that. So it's still the same problem, and it used to be the same problem back in the day. You had 23 seconds to capture this image, and most of that was to read the sensor and then write it into what's called a cassette. So I am old enough to know what that thing is in the back. I don't know if you guys are. Um, some of you would know, I am sure, but um, sometimes my Facebook feed would show like this cassette and right next to it is a pencil. And who knows how they are related? Do people know how they're related? Okay, great, people know. It's a good legacy. Was there a question? Okay, excellent, people know how they're related. Uh, if you don't know, don't worry about it. There's a cassette, you can see it right in the back of the camera, so you can see the lens in the front of the blue thing. On the other side of the blue thing, you can see a cassette. And then there's a whole bunch of electronics right down. The cassette would start to, it's just a band, electromagnetic, it's just a magnetic band. So you can write zeros and ones to it. Um, what you've seen before, I said, you know, every single image, 0 0.1 megapixels, that's, that would be 10 kilopixels, right? If you had a single bit for each one of them, you know, you're trying to write a kilobyte into that. So it's a thousand bytes it has to be written there. And it takes 23 seconds. So that's kind of a bit of a history. Um, and nowadays, so you know, we have these cameras. Uh, you take a picture and it will give you the pixels. For every pixel, 
it will give you a value of red, value of green, and value of blue. Now we all know that from using red, green, blue, you can generate colors by mixing them, right? We know that. So you might think actually that red, green, blue is a, is a, is a force of nature. Stuff is made out of red, green, blue. You might think that, which doesn't happen to be the case. Turns out the reason why we build cameras red, green, blue is because how our, that's how our eyes capture the environment. Technically, colors is just electromagnetic waves. There's a spectrum. Every color is a single frequency. Yes, you can mix red, green, and blue to get other frequencies because red, green, blue are, are you know, sort of somewhat separated from one another. But it really doesn't have to be red, green, blue. It's just our eyes are made that way, and we started that way. Let me go into that a little bit so we understand red, green, blue. And the conclusion that we're going to draw is that it doesn't have to be red, green, blue. So we're going to derive another thing that we can work with better. OK? So this is um, electromagnetic waves. These are all the same things from radio waves to microwaves to visible light to x-rays to gamma rays. So radio waves we use a lot, right? You, um, I mean, at least we used to use a lot. I don't know, nowadays we use cable TV or something like that, but you know, you could, back in the day, you could open up a radio and, and, and you know, your radio would start to give you some speech that you can listen to or TV. Um, that's nothing but light. It's the same concept. It just has a different wavelength. Depending on the wave, wavelength, you can penetrate certain things. For example, if you have such a huge wavelength, radio waves, you can penetrate, I don't know, concrete, and things like that. Um, so microwave is kind of very similar. So as you keep increasing frequency, decreasing wavelength, smaller and smaller. So a radio wave could easily have kilometers of wavelength. So it's just some sort of a wave. With, um, but you know, like a, as you get towards the visible light, you will get to micro or nanometers, right? And, and we've all seen sort of, you know, x-rays. I don't know. You can. X-ray is something special that doesn't penetrate your bones, but it does penetrate your soft tissue. It penetrates water. So we use it for medical purposes. Gamma rays penetrates everything and destroys your DNA, so you don't want to be close to it. Um, you might get cancer. But this is it. And visible light is just a portion of it. The, ray, the reason why our eyes seem to have evolved to understand visible light is because that's what we're getting from the sun. So the sun sends out a whole bunch of electromagnetic waves, just given the kinds of physical processes happening in there. And it gives us that spectrum much more strongly than others, the visible light. And it seems like our eyes have, have essentially evolved to capture what sun is shining. Okay. Now, always keep in mind, we don't have to build sensors this way. We can easily build sensors that can, for example, we'll talk about infrared sensors. So you can see the red spectrum right there. Infrared meaning beyond red. So you can see the beyond red spectrum. And you can look into this environment beyond red. Interestingly, your laser scanner works that way. It's, you know, it's, it's a laser. It's pointing a laser and trying to understand distances that way. But you don't see anything, right? It's because your eyes cannot capture it. It's infrared. So the way this would work is um, you, know, you would be looking at a, an object where you shine some light. It would reflect right. Um, there's some sort of an illumination spectrum of that object. So it, you know, it reflects these kinds of frequencies. So these range from 400 nanometers to 1,000 nanometers, one micrometer. That's within the visible range. Most of it is. Um, and sorry, this is illumination. So this is what you illuminate, the light that you send. And then it reflects certain colors better than others. So for example, it's, I'm, I'm looking at just the frequencies. Like 3,000, it doesn't reflect that well. And some of the others, it reflects better. Basically, what happens is that you illuminate it with a certain kind of light. And if it reflects some of the things, you can imagine just multiplying those two at every frequency. And that's what you'll be seeing afterwards. So um, the way our eye captures colors gives us red, green, blue. So if you look at your eye, you know, it's anatomy. You would see a lens and a retina. And there is a central fovea where you know, the light would actually fall from the retina. Um, and there are a certain set of nerve cells in there. In particular, there are two types, the, ro the rods and the cones that the light would come in. And they would take, you know, they would be excited in terms of when they see different lights and, 
and they would send signals to your brain. If you look through it, they are separated throughout your eye. And you know, these different types of cells, one of them will be picking how bright the scene is, and the other one will be picking what kind of colors that you're seeing. The one that's picking up the colors, so you're kind of seeing how many there are in your retina on one image, and as you look at the center of the retina, there's a lot of them. As you go out, there's less and less so. And, um, and, and the, the key thing is that the cells, um, if you look through the cells, you will see that there are cells that kind of capture red color, there are cells that capture green color, and there are cells that capture blue color. Together with that, there are some cells that just capture the intensity of the color. If you look at the center of your eye, you would see a lot of cells that capture the colors, and less so that capture intensity. If you go outside, you go to the peripheral of your vision, you would see a lot more cells that capture just intensity, but doesn't capture the color. Your eyes would use that for attention. So you know, you're kind of standing here, and you know, I don't know, back 10,000 years ago, you'd be standing right here, there'd be a lion running, and the intensity would change very quickly, and you, you would be attracted to that area that there's some attention to it. Otherwise, as you look into the environment, you would easily pick red, green, and blue. Any changes in red, green, and blue, especially red, would alert you. It seems like that's another thing that we've evolved to. I don't know, maybe there's a fire or something, some red something is happening, and you would be attracted to that, any changes in color in red. Nowadays, we use that a lot. Like, I don't know, you, um, you can wear a red dress or a red tie, and people will be attracted to that, right? That's because you have cells in your eyes that would capture that very quickly. If you look at the figure on top on the other side, on sort of your right side, you would see the sensitivities of those cells that capture color. Those are the cone cells. As I told you, there are three different ones. One of them would capture blue, so, or rather it would capture a spectrum of colors, would be excited by a spectrum of colors that are centered at blue. One of them would be at green, and the other one would be at red. So now when you look at an object like this, you would illuminate that object with a set of you know, light frequencies, and then it would reflect a certain ones and damp others, right? And then your, the cells in your eyes would pick certain colors. And then that's how you would construct red, green, and blue. Now, if you look at CCD cameras today, we have a sensor that only measures how many photons fall on that sensor. It doesn't care about the frequency. It, it does, it's not related. It's just, it's a single sensor. A certain number of photons will fall on it. It will trigger depending on the number of photons. There's a capacitor on the other end. More photons fall in, the capacitor will fill more. So in order to construct color into it, what we do is we take a single sensor and we put a filter on it. We put a filter that only takes in the red photons, the red frequency photons, and everything else it reflects out. Now usually in CCD cameras, you would have four of these things stacked up together, just like your eye, one for red, one for green, blue, and one just intensity. And so these four of them would be packed into a square just with a filter on it so that you would distinguish blue, green, and red out of these images. So those are what the filters would give you, as well as the intensity, all right? We thought that we should do it this way because we knew how the eye works, and we thought that once we capture it this way, then we can produce it on the screen with the same red, green, blue, and so whatever our eye is capturing, we just converge to that. So the conclusion is the world has nothing to do with red, green, blue. It's just our eye has evolved that way for a variety of reasons that we somewhat understand, but not quite. Okay, it seems like red is something we should be attracted to because I, I guess because there's a fire, and maybe green and blue are you know, the colors of Earth, right? And those are the colors that you look out and you see. I mean, oceans are blue, vegetation is green, and so I guess we pick those. Um, it's just three random colors. But it seems like we constructed cameras that way now. So if you connect your camera, it's going to give you red, green, blue values. Just because it has red, green, blue filters, 
on the sensors that it has. Now you can then think about every color as a combination of red, green, blue. So the camera will give you often values for red, values for green, and values for blue. If you allocate one byte for each one of them, it will be ranging from 0 to 255. 256 is 2 to the 8. Single byte is 8 bits, right? It's giving you that. And then you can combine these colors, as you can see here, to get different values. Like you can combine, if you get a lot of red and a lot of green, you'll get yellow. If you get a lot of blue and a lot of red, you'll get, I don't know, purple, and so on, you know? So we get this from the camera. Um, nowadays, if you buy an LCD screen, you will exactly have the same thing for every pixel in the screen. Like one thing you can do is you can run your TV, stop the, the, the motion somehow, maybe show, have it show it a picture, and get very close and take a picture, and you can actually see what those pixels are showing. You will see for every pixel, there's a red, green, blue, and an intensity light. So there's a red, green, blue, and a white light. And for every pixel, it just kind of combines them to show you some sort of a color in combination. It just comes exactly from the camera. Now we want to use these things to do a variety of things for our robots, right? That's what we get as data. That's good to know. So we, what we know is it's in red, green, blue, often coming from the camera. Another thing that we know is that there's a lot of data coming in, so we want to process it quickly. What we want to do is you want to do object recognition. That's one of the things that we often want to do. Like, for example, um, you may have an object, like a set of chairs, how chairs look like in your database. You may want to look at an image and say, where are the chairs? Where are the people in this image? Imagine you're building a self-driving car, right? You don't want to hit people, so you want to find where people are. Um, object detection can be as complicated as that. Or it can be as simple as you may want to detect a blob or an edge or you have a corner and little features and things like that. Um, or you can, you can, you know, as you do these things, you need to kind of think about how do you do these objects kind of look different from image to image. So it's pretty hard because, you know, you take a picture and someone is far away and they're much smaller and they're very close and they're big. So there's a change in size. There's a change in lighting, right? It's different in sunlight versus here. Just imagine red, green, blues. It's just different. Or there's a change in viewpoint. So you can look at it from the front or you can look at me on from the side. You still need to recognize me, but it's, it looks very different on a camera. So you need to kind of go with that. We're going to do a lot of things in the class, like a few things that we're gonna start out with, sort of detecting lines, maybe a little blobs. So this um, week, you're going to focus on line following. You're going to do like, a, one thing you're gonna do is visual servoing. So you're gonna have a little, you know, I don't know, cone or something that you can go and park in front. And the other one is line following, whereby you have a line on the floor and you just want to follow it with your car. And so for all of them, you will use the image and you will want to find a little blob um, in the image that won't be, it might, you might think it's kind of easy, you know, you're looking at a little image like this and you would like to kind of just put like a bounding box. I mean, you can, if you're trying to find a red cone, you can just find the red objects in the image. That may look kind of very simple. Um, you could, for example, write code that says, you know, you can look at object pixels, um, you know, the pixels that are a part of the object that you're searching in the image. Uh, you can set it to an empty set to start with, and you can search through the width and the height of the image, and if a pixel is red that you're looking at, you could put it into your object pixel bucket. So this is a part of the object, you think. And if the set of pixels kind of looks like a ball or looks like a cone. You just found it. Simple software, very simple code. What can go wrong with this? Any thoughts? Yep. Um, if you not stay with the pretty light in the room. Yeah, that's another thing. Like for example, and a, a cone is red doesn't mean that it doesn't reflect at all some of the other frequencies. So you'll get, with different lighting, you'll get different things being reflected. In particular, you know, you want to not only kind of park in front of the cone under sunlight, but you want to do the same thing to show off to your friends in a party where there's a disco ball, and so you won't be able to do that. I don't know why you would go to a party with a disco ball, but if you do and you want to demo it, 
in the room if it's dark, then even if it's a very red object, the red value won't be that high. Excellent. Intensity is another problem. So we just found that other colors may be reflected. Intensity is a problem. I read in the photo, and I'll be confused because they'll say that there's a one a lot of balloons rather than just a lot. Excellent. Shape is a problem. Like, how are we detecting shape? There's one more. OK, we'll get to it. But we found quite a few interesting things. Other colors may be reflected. Intensity will be a problem. Shape is another problem. So you might talk about something for specific color, like a design But if it's, like, if it's slightly different shape, Shade is the final. So then there is the shade. So we'll look at these four properties, shape and three other color properties that we're going to look at in a second. It came out from the room excellent. So you might want to find this green ball, for example. Um, this is one kind of green, right? This is another kind of green. And you zoom in, it looks very different. This is what the camera is going to give you in terms of red, green, blue. Um, this is a different one. And there's some edges in there and so on that you have to deal with. And not to mention the shape and there are other green stuff around and, and things like that that you're going to have to, you're going to have to fight. So here's another representation that we'll use a lot more. Uh, we call this HSV color model, hue, saturation, and value. How many of you have heard of HSV before? There are some, not all. OK, good. So HSV is a bit more robust to illumination. It's a lot more closer to how light is initially produced. So the hue value is much like the frequency that you're getting out of it. OK? That you can imagine that as the frequency. Saturation is how much are you concentrated on that very frequency? Are you getting a very concentrated response? Like it's just red coming out? Or it's a little bit kind of some of the other colors merged in there? If you have a lot of saturation, you're getting one color. If you have less saturation, it's a lot of colors merged in. If you have zero saturation, you just see white right at the center. Okay? And value is how much intensity there is. Is that little illuminated or is it a lot illuminated? And so this takes it, although you're getting red, green, blue from the camera, right? just because our eyes evolved that way and we decided to build the cameras that, that way, HSV model is actually much more meaningful when you're doing image processing, because it's, it's very much closer to how light behaves physically so that you can understand what is being reflected from uh, the object that you're trying to detect and comes into the camera. So you can use HSV values to, for example, find um, a red ball. You can say, well, the hue value would be in the red piece. But you know the saturation could be whatever. If it's more red, then that's great. If it's less red, then there may be a different colored light kind of being thrown at it. And the value could be very high, so that's great. It's a very well illuminated scene. But it could be low as well, and that's, that's OK. So maybe it's not very well illuminated, but I can still pick up red. So then an object detection um, would be half fixed. Um, you would still you know, be able to detect red objects. but. You still have one problem, which is the shape, which was also mentioned. So the shape is, you know, you can, I don't know how to fix shape very easily. So you can, for example, you need to implement the function that says, is this a ball? You can have a set of pixels that I called S. Uh, one thing you can do is you can look at its size. I mean, you can look at the width and the height of the set of pixels and see if it's the right size. And, and I was going to ask you guys how this might fail, but I think, you know, you can construct a gazillion failing modes for this. So, um, you know, I don't know. Um, the last three things are roughly of the same size, but you know, one of them is two bowls, the other one is several, and so on. So things may look very different. It may not even be the shape of a bowl, or it may be just a whole bunch of pixels around. And, and, and so just looking at the size and, and making it equal doesn't cut it. You need to somehow implement if something is bowl shaped, okay? And that, often is kind of like the hard part of things that you're going to do this week. So, um, so for example, one thing you can do is you can find the centroid of the pixels and try to capture the biggest ball with all pixels being red, for example. You can do the same thing for a cone. 
Um, so I think Ari will have you implement some bits and pieces of this. And so um, if you wanted to really do some much more complicated object detection, there are multiple ways to do it. One way is the set of ways that we call model-based. Model-based methods will allow you to, for example, understand how an image looks like and then try to extract some features that describe that image, put it on your database, and then try to, when a new image comes in, extract features again and see if the features match. We do these kinds of things a lot, so we call them descriptors. I'm not gonna go into some of these things, but uh, often we come up with descriptors that I'm going to show you in a second. We believe that our brain works that way. Okay, so our brain, it turns out, has some filters that basically you know, looks around and extract a few features and then just compares those features constantly to detect what images look like. So nowadays neuroscience is powerful enough to understand these little circuits and things like that that are happening in your brain. The visual cortex in your brain is right at the back of your brain. So it's very interesting anatomy, but your eyes are connected to the back of your brain and that's where the visual processing is done. It's also kind of quite closer to your spine sometimes for reflexes, like if something is running at you, you would, I don't know, tennis ball thrown at you, you will pull your head type of thing. But also it's kind of feeds um, information to where the high level processing will be done. So one kind of feature that we found is good in robotics. We're not yet sure sort of our brain exactly does that. It's called SIFT, Scale Invariant Feature Transform, S-I-F-T. We sometimes spell it as SIFT. Um, SIFT is an interesting algorithm that I think you'll learn the basics of this week. Um, I'm just going to tell you in a very, very simple way. What we do is we take an image and we look at different windows in the image. And for every window, we look at how the image is changing as you go you know, from one pixel to another. And then we compute gradients. Like for example, how is the intensity changing? which direction is the intensity increasing. So you can find a whole bunch of directions that way, right, throughout that small window. And then you can create a histogram of those changes. And then you can save these histograms. Each one of these histograms is a feature. It's kind of like a sift. And then when you get a new image, you do the same transformation and you look at the histograms again. If the histograms are a good match, you're looking at the same object. If the histograms are not a good match, then you're not looking at the same object. So you can come and you know, take a picture of this room. You can compute these histograms and save it somewhere. You can then come and take another picture of this room and you can try to see if the histograms match. This kind of a transform seems to be scale invariant. Like for example, I can take a picture that's close or I can take a picture that's far away and it seems like the histograms are still very similar, which kind of makes sense, right? It's a chair and you're just looking at how the intensity changes and each, why does it change. Interestingly, it also doesn't depend so much on the viewpoint either. You know, like for example, up to 30, 40 degrees. You can take a picture from here. You can go and take a picture from over there. You turn the, 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 the viewpoint a little bit, but still, you know, like if you look at single pixels and around it, it doesn't change so much, right? And, um, and so, so this basic idea we're finding is actually very powerful. Like for example, um, so this is a, a place in Italy. Um, so two different pictures of it you're seeing. Um, it'll take you some time to understand this is the same place. Okay, one there's a couple right in front, but it's the background is the same as this picture here. And lighting is very different. The viewpoint is quite different. Scale is different. One of them is kind of closer, the other one is far away. But it turns out that if you run this kind of algorithm, SIFT algorithm, this is an example I think on, it was on Wikipedia when I took it five years ago. I hope still it's on Wikipedia, but uh, if you look at the SIFT article on Wikipedia, you'll see this example. The SIFT algorithm will tell you these are the same places because it's actually seeing that geometric structure and understanding it quite well. All right, and, um, and so, so you're going to be doing sort of similar things, if not work with SIFT, um, let's not kind of go through this, but if not work with SIFT, SIFT, you're going to try to find like objects and different colors and spaces and so on. And as you do that, you're going to realize a few things. Uh, one of them is that um, it's really, uh, it's hard to work with images. You know, like you, um, you get an image and um, it's a task that you do so well. 
Now, you can recognize people um, with your kind of eyes and your brain is very well tuned for it. But all of a sudden, you're going to see that you, know, you need to write code and red, green, blue is coming. And what do you do? And it's going to be challenging to come up with new algorithms. Also, your brain um, kind of is, is really uh, tuned to understand these kinds of environments and can be fooled very, very easily. Um, in this picture that you're looking at, how many of you know this picture? Many of you, that's great. This is an optical illustration, uh, illusion. The color, the gray tone in A and B are the same. It's the same gray tone. It's the same red, green, blue that you're getting from your camera when you look at it. Uh, but your eyes see it very differently uh, because, you know, largely because um, you think that there's a shadow there and your eyes is kind of seeing it very differently. You can, we'll give you the slides. You're more than welcome to print out the slide and just kind of look at it, a little window here and a little window there. You will see it's the same gray that you're seeing. It just looks very different here. One thing I'd like to do very quickly, I am hoping that we have time for it, is that I would like to show you, just in a couple movies, what we can do with computer vision nowadays in robotics. I would like to kind of caution you, this is not, this is not what you're gonna do here, but hopefully one day, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're roboticists yourselves and you're doing robotics and maybe you're interested in these kinds of things and, and you will do it for yourself. So the, I think this is gonna take maybe a couple minutes, but uh, one thing I'll show you is, is this thing. Um, like I said, you can use stereo configuration to generate depth, right? This is the, an image taken from, with this, these are set of videos that are taken with the Z camera that you guys are using in your car. And so with the same red camera, the Z camera, you can capture two images and you can use that to generate depth. When you look at the scene, if, and something is very close to two cameras, they'll be in very different locations on the camera. If they're very far, they'll be in the pretty much the same location so you can see some depth. You can look at an image like this and you can actually capture depth. White stuff is closer, black stuff is further away. Um, if you were to look at much more complicated areas, you can generate something that looks like this as you're, for example, flying in this case with a drone, so that, for instance, you can, you can understand obstacles. I have a couple graduate sort of school friends who are doing a company called Skydio in the Silicon Valley, and they have a, like a little drone that you know, they're gonna put out in the market you know, soon, and you know, it just kind of follows you around. It doesn't hit any one of the obstacles, and you can, I don't know, kind of walk out from here, it'll walk out from the door with you. It has eight cameras sort of in stereo configurations around it, and it uses a TX1. It's the same thing that you have in the cars, except it's made into a drone and it flies, and it completely sees around using kind of stereo images. And you know, there's, I don't know, there's a lot of examples that you, know, you can kind of play with. Um, it's just kind of changing to see where the colors are. Let me, uh, I was gonna show you what you can kind of, so, so this is the kind of 3D structure that the camera would be seeing. It's not very, very pretty, but um, you, know, you, can, you can make stuff up and you don't have to collide with obstacles, okay? So the stereo reconstruction is one of them. And you can tune it. So here's some research from, um, from Professor John Leonard's group, uh, who is also at MIT. This is very recent, but you can tune it in such a way that the same camera, is, again, the Z camera, can give you these images and you can process them in real time at you know, 60 hertz or more um, and you can accumulate them into a map and generate like what we call a point cloud that kind of looks like this as you drive around and you can see objects just from two cameras. You can see the whole depth in their, uh, their reconstruction. And um, so that's one thing we can do with cameras. Another thing that I'd like to quickly outline that we can do with cameras is, is right here. So 
So this kind of um, technique, uh, we call it, so this is actually kind of a video will come in, but uh, the title was kind of not quite right. So this, is, um, so this is another technology. Here what you're seeing is a single camera. It's a monocular camera, one camera, and an inertial measurement unit, much similar to what you have on your car. And you're just moving around with one camera, and you're seeing those points. Those are features, just a bunch of points that we find in the environment. We track them. And looking at how points move, right, as we move the camera, we can merge that with the IMU to understand how the camera is moving in the environment. Right? So for example, you move a little forward this way, you move back, and you can look at how the environment is moving, and you can understand how the camera moved with respect to that. And the IMU gives you a little bit more information, you can fuse it in, and you can get like this beautiful reconstruction of the trajectory. That's what you're seeing. Once you find the trajectory, then you can look at the features that you're tracking, you can triangulate them, we'll learn all these things. And then you can find their position in 3D as well. So you can see 3D with one camera and one inertial measurement unit, which is what this is doing. So it's developing a, 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 a system sort of to be able to do that. Okay, so this kind of technique is called visual slam. It's another thing that you can, you can do nowadays with, with cameras. And, um, and there were a couple things, but I think that we're kind of like sort of running out of time as well. And and um. And I just want to show you sort of very quickly uh, the kinds of things that, that we do uh, in my research group nowadays. And I'll, in one second, I'll kind of just finish there. This is very close. So I am, um, I'm personal, so I couldn't find the video very easily, but I went to YouTube. So I'm personally very interested in drone technology. Um, this didn't quite fit in the camera. So I am kind of like personally very interested in, in building drones and, and so on. And um, you know, we have a number of projects. One thing we do is that we take a drone, we put it under motion capture, right? This motion capture is a technology that's used by filmmakers. So you know, you, go to a theater nowadays, you know, you see like a, I don't know, some monster walking around and doing all human-like motions. The way that's done is there's a person who is wearing a kind of a suit with a lot of markers and goes around in, and is tracked by infrared cameras that's called motion capture. And, um, and the, the, the movement of that person, him or her, is reconstructed by computers and transferred into digital agents. We use that kind of technology as follows. We have a drone that flies in an empty room, right? We understand where its position is from markers. We pass that to a supercomputer to render a different environment photorealistically like you would do in video games. And then we pass that image back to the robot. So here is our lab. The robot is going around inside our lab. It's an empty place but it thinks that it's in this environment. In particular, a simulated camera image that's generated photorealistically on a supercomputer is conveyed to the drone. So the drone is seeing this, although it's going in an empty room. And it's using this particular image as a single camera and fusing it with its inertial measurement unit to understand how it's going around, okay? So you can, it's able to see sort of in 3D with a single camera and find its own position. You can kind of, we can have it go around for a long time and we can see that the trajectory that it estimates, which is in red, is the same as the very close to the trajectory that is sort of being, um, that's the real trajectory that we, cap we get from the motion capture. And so, you know, this is kind of like a complicated technology, but sort of the point being is that you can, you can sort of build these kind of things and, and we, in building these things, what we do is we build drones like this. It's the same as what you have in the car. It has multiple cameras, but it essentially flies a Jetson computer, and you know, and so on. 
So I'm just gonna leave it there. Um, so it's gonna be an exciting kind of start. In one week, you can only learn so much, but hopefully this is going to be a, a good start for you guys. We're going to find blobs and park in front of cones and follow lines and do some interesting things. Um, I think, you know, I was supposed to finish at 10 and I'm a little over time, but. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, any, any questions? Yep. So with that, um, that perception technique with, uh, with that I and yield points, um, you said that it affects depth based, by, based like as the camera moves, how the point moves with it. But like, how does it know like how to keep that point there? Or, like, does some CPU put like a virtual point there, or like is the room actually full of points on the wall? No. So when I look at this environment, um, we haven't learned these things, but we'll learn a little bit during the course. Um, we call these kind of points like features. So when you look at the camera, like I, I look at this wall, you know, you look at here, you will notice that a lot of this wall is very much the same, right? So for example, this is a white. It's the same color. So pick, if you pick a point from here, in the next camera image, it'll be pretty hard to see where it is again. But this is a great corner. So if you pick this point, right? I have a camera image, I pick this point, and my camera moved a little bit, in the next frame, I need to understand where that point is again. But it's easy for me to do. If you look back at this movie, like you, it's kind of seeing points around. If you look at it very carefully, the points fall on the corners, there's, there's a lot from the ladder, and you know, we kind of cheated a little bit, right? We put all these posters and things like that, so if we had a white wall over there, the system wouldn't work. And, and it's the same for your eyes too, like as you, for example, I mean, it's very easy for us to just kind of walk around in spaces, but imagine you yourself running around. And if you get into a space where there are no visual features, you'll be pretty confused. Um, so it's kind of like the same system in some ways. So the way this kind of algorithms work, we're not gonna go into the details now, but for you guys to know for just at this point, you look at the environment and you look at little bits and pieces of camera images that you can match in the second frame. And that matching will be done in a very small window, like 10 by 10 pixels. You would just go and find the same thing in the next frame. This was good. Anything else? Yeah? So I don't know how to try angulation works. So you're in a room, right? And then you see a set of points. And then when you leave the room and come back, how do you know it's the same set of points that you triangulate with? Um, yeah, so that turns out. So here, I didn't show you that. That turns out to be like one of the hard problems that we do for research today. So some of that is called, like it's very similar to so what we call loop closure, your question, meaning you, know, you kind of see some things here, you go out, you know, you're kind of still tracking your movement. You're only tracking where you've been with respect to your starting point. You go around and you come back here and you say, is this the same thing that I've seen before? And you want to match it together. That happens to be kind of a tough problem that people still work on. And so there, you know, in my right of approaches, um, Work. Some work well, some don't, and, and it's a complicated story, but it's an important problem is what I can tell you right now. Yeah? So with your simulated room, was that your, camp, your uh, helicopter had a little bit of um, inaccuracy, but was that, how much was that due to the camera and how much due to the simulation? So in these kinds of you know, examples, um, what we can achieve usually is, um, can I end up closing? But in these kind of examples, what we can achieve usually, you start from here, and you would like to have this camera and I am you use that to find you know, where you are with respect to your starting point. So you can people use that because you wanna do that with your phone, right? So for example, you have a single camera and an IMU on your phone. Imagine just holding your phone like this and going around. Often the errors that pe people can achieve is 0.5%. That's the error that we had. 0.5% is very special because that's about the resolution of your camera and, and the errors in your IMU. Like if you made no mistakes, you would get that much error just because you look at a scene, well, there's a pixel error, right? You have one pixel, could be here, could be there, and there's some error you're making and things accumulate. Now, 0.5% is very little. I mean, you know, you could, go like 100 meters, which is huge, 
And you could make, I don't know, like a, what does that come down to, half a meter or something like that? Yeah. So it's like five millimeters per meter traveled. It's quite, a, quite little. But often people shoot for that. Now, if you can come back here, like for example, if I go out from this room, walk around, 100 meters and come back, I'll be five meters off, or I'll be half a meter off, right? But if I can understand where I am and match it back, then I can reduce these errors immediately. So some things people work on. How many of you have, have heard of, like now that questions came about this kind of particular technology, how many of you heard of the Apple AR kit? Apple AR kit? One person, wow, that's interesting. So here is, um, so this is going to be hard to find, but um, here is a kind of a technology that Apple just kind of has put out um, that you know you can you can use. I I'm looking for a specific video and I hope that I can find it. But um, so this is what you can do with the AR kit. It's going to be available, I believe, starting in the fall. So I'm going to try to find a nice video, kind of explaining it, and we'll see how successful I'll be in doing that. But, um, so let's look at this. So this is kind of like a business insider story. Okay, we may have to watch an ad, but uh, hopefully it's going to be kind of like, uh, oh, really? So the reason I want to kind of show you guys this is because it's going to be extremely related to the technology, and I'll, I'll describe to you in a second like how and why that just happens to be the case. Okay, so this is kind of like the AR kit being introduced. Um, so you can take your phone, um, kind of you know, somewhat simply speaking, you can kind of take your phone and you're looking at a table, your phone is seeing the table, you can add a cup on that table and a cup is added. And so the cup is completely um, generated somewhat photorealistically on the GPU of your phone. And somehow, you know, like even as you move the phone, right, that cup stays there. It doesn't kind of move. So maybe cup is not the most fun thing, but you know you can imagine a Pokemon sitting there that you're trying to catch. So that would be a little bit more fun. But as you move the cup around, you know you can the lighting kind of adjusts to it and things like that. Um, so these are some of the simple things that you can do. Um, you can you can do the following. Um, you can take um, you know you can take your iPad. Your iPad will find it. You can kind of start your game on that table. It rolls out brings out a city and then you know people would come out in that city this is like the table is completely empty but everything is happening on your iPad screen so if you were to hold your iPad you know on this table when you look through the iPad you will see a whole bunch of stuff happening clearly there's nothing on the table this is for augmented reality so you can see you can do quite a bit the way this technology will work is that there's a camera and an IMU as you move it around, it will pick up features from the table. If you point to the empty table, it doesn't work. Okay, you need to have some features in the table. And it will track those features as you're going around to understand where the camera is with respect to those features. And every time it's putting an object on the table, it has to move it as you turn the camera around. And that's how AR will, would be done. This is a kind of a technology that's you know, like a year or two ahead from your smartphones. Just get ready for it as it's developing. It's an impact, I think, of the things that we've been doing in robotics and it's finally being applied to these types of technologies. You will get the same thing from, from, um, from Apple. I believe you'll get the same thing from Samsung. You'll get it from Facebook. Facebook has been working on it tremendously. These kinds of things will be available like in the next year or two. Okay, all right, any other questions? Yep. Going back to the other simulation, um, the drone was able to detect still objects in the empty room, right? Yeah. How, was, how does it respond to moving objects? So, for example, if a person or something, I don't know, a fan in the room, how would it respond to that? Would it stop or would it maneuver around that moving object? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when things are moving, even for the Apple AR kit, so as you're trying to do something, if you walk in front of the AR kit, you can confuse it. Um, the reason why it would get confused is because you know, it's just trying to look at how those pixels move. And from the movement of the pixels, it's calculating how the camera would move. So it's assuming all the pixels are stationary. Now, you can still understand some of the things. You can say, well, you know, like these are here and those are moving this way. There's no way to move the camera so that this kind of a thing happens. So some of the pixels must be moving, and you can take that out. But if more than 50% of the scene is moving, there's nothing you can do about it. Like this actually happens to us a lot. Like for example, I don't know if you ever had this thing, like you're sitting inside an airplane, right? And then something else is moving outside on the other hand, and you think that you're moving. You get this feeling that you're moving the other way. And it's the same thing that applies to these things. Okay, so it's just kind of unrelated videos are, are showing. Um, it's the same thing that kind of applies to this. Um, it's the same thing that applies to this, and there's sort of, um, you know, no way to fix it in a way. The way they, they do it is that they have like some ways to detect objects that might move in context objects like people. You can detect people and say don't look at features off of people because they'll, they're not going to sit stationary as this amazing technology is being showcased, right? Um, let me try to find one more thing. And I was just going to say that it may also be kind of useful for like practical purposes. So here's a person who is using AR kit to measure their room. And so um, you know, you kind of just take it as you move it. The good thing is that it knows how much the camera is moving. It can also understand where that corner is in 3D by triangulating. And as you kind of move it around, it completely measures your room. So these kind of things will be possible to do. And you know, if you're curious, what is the, I'm always curious, what's the size of a you know, room or, or you know, um, what's the volume of my car? You know, there's two ways you can measure it. You can take your car and you can dump it in the water and you can see how much overflow there is and that's one way to. Or you can use augmented reality to go around your car and it'll measure, okay? There's some nice applications of this kind of thing. But uh, here, We'll be starting off with just some of the very, very basic computer vision elements, having in mind so much can be achieved by just using cameras, either two cameras or a camera and IMU and things like that. And I think as you guys graduate from this program and you, know, you go back and live another year or two of your lives, you will see these things coming out. In particular, this thing is coming out in, in literally in September. Um, so wait for it. 